about the rational numbers if you want. And then x will be a, I'm trying to use a thinner one. x is a smooth geometrically integral k variety. And by variety, I mean a separated scheme of finite type over k. So slightly more restricted than in uh, Bekiel's talk. Okay, and capital omega k will be the set of places of k for any v in omega k. Uh, kv will be the completion and ov will be the valuation ring. Okay, so this is only defined if v is non-Archimedean. Okay, and then AK will be the Adele ring of K. All right, so remember our question is given X, X over K, how do we determine if X of K is non-empty? Okay, so that's, that's the question we're trying to answer. If um, for some reason some oracle told you that x does indeed have a rational point, then you can just search and search and search until you find one. But if you uh, think that there is not one, how do you show that there is not one? Or how do you know that you should give up searching? Okay, so we don't have a complete answer to this question, but what I'm going to talk about are some ways where we can provably show that the set of uh, k points is empty. All right, so when I started my first lecture, what I talked about was the first interesting example. And I said that it was interesting because we always have, um, well, just from k living inside of every completion, we have some necessary conditions right away. So given, so if x of k is not empty, then that k point is also a kv point, so x of kv is also non empty. Um, and you can actually show that, well, if you have a k point, then you can actually, okay, so for any k variety x, you could spread it out over um, the ring of s integers of k. So away from finitely many primes, you can spread it out and get a model. So then you can ask whether your k point is an OV point. And just like we know that every element of k is in OV for all but finitely many places, the same thing happens with the kv points. So uh, what you actually get is that the product, the restricted product of the x of the kvs, script x of OVs, that this is non-empty. You take the product over all places, and you can show uh, it's an exercise in uh, Chesnavichus's exercise set that this restricted direct product is the same as the set of adelic points of x. So another way we can rephrase this is that if you have a k-rational point, then you have an adelic point, which you can also think of like this. And just a remark, if x is proper, then the set of adelic points, you don't need this restricted direct product. You just take the product of all of the kv points. Okay? So that's what we have. So this is our um, first necessary condition we have. So, okay, but the goal is to try to figure out how we can actually determine. Like, I hand you a set of equations, what do we do to actually check that? So if I'm going to give you this necessary condition, I should also give you some reason why it should be helpful. Like, maybe I just handed you some necessary thing, but it's also imp it's impossible to check, so, you know, it didn't, didn't do any good. So we want to know why this, why this is actually helpful. So, well, kv is 
complete. It's the completion. So we have a lot more tools at our disposal. So the set of kV rational points is easier to compute. Okay, this is a very vague sentence. I understand that, but it's the idea I want to get across. So, um, and so for an, any individual v, it's easier to compute. So for the reals, you know, we can use Newton's method and just make sure we're close enough to zero, and then we know that there will actually be a solution. And Hensel's lemma does the same thing for non-Archimedean places. So for any individual v, it's easier to compute. But as we saw in the example earlier today, also you can deal with all but finitely many places v all at once. So furthermore, the Vey conjectures, which were proved by Deline, then uh, they show that no matter what variety you take, x of kv is non-empty for all v outside of a finite subset of places. So immediately in one fell swoop, you deal about with all but finitely many, and then for each individual one, it's easy to check. So this is actually, um, is actually a better condition. Um, I am not necessarily saying that it's always easy. So for instance, if you want to check that it's a real point and I hand you you know, something like a billion equations of very high degree. I personally do not actually know how you would compute that there is a real point on there, but there is an algorithm to do so. But we are not yet at the point where we're dealing with billions of equations of very high degree. So for everything we're going to consider, we can treat this part as easy. Okay, so we have this necessary condition that if you have a k rational point, then you have to have an adelic point. But we already saw that this is not sufficient. Right? We saw an example this morning that had kv points for every place v, but no k point. So the question is, why not? What other conditions have to be checked? What is special about the set of adelic points that come from a k rational point? What are the other properties that have to be satisfied? So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is something called the Brauer-Mannan obstruction. So this was developed by Manin in 1970, and it encodes these quadratic reciprocity arguments that I was talking about this morning. So the example this morning is an uh, example of this type of thing. So where does this come from? Well, so let's just let f be any field, given a field f and an f point. So an f point. You know, I can think of in terms of the equations, but I can also think of it geometrically as just a map from spec f to x. So then we obtain a pullback map on the Brouwer group, from the Brouwer group of x to the Brouwer group of f. And as we saw this morning, there are um, a few different points of view you can take for the Brouwer group, so I am always going to take the point of view that this is a tall cohomology, XGM, and uh, I'm always going to be taking X smooth, so I can think of this as living inside an element of the Brouwer group of the function field. So for me, a Brouwer class, and I can think of it as, as long as I'm away from the characteristic, as an element, a central simple algebra over the function field whose residue is trivial at all codimension one points. And that's the point of view I'm going to take for these lectures. So given an, L, given an F point, we get a map on the Brouwer group, which uh, is pullback, but I'm going to think of as being evaluation. So I'm going to write this. If you fix an alpha in the Brouwer group of X, then alpha of P will be the image of alpha under this map. Okay. Um, 
So let's do an example. So if your x is given by the equations xy plus 5z squared minus s squared equals 0, and x plus y times x plus 2y uh, minus s squared plus 5t squared equals 0. So this is inside of P4. Okay, so I can take the algebra, the quaternion algebra, given by 5x plus y over x. Okay, and I um, the claim, so this is an element in the Brouwer group of the function field of x, and I claim that this is actually in the Brouwer group of x. Okay, so how are we going to check this? So Okay, so let's remember what we take. So let me use little x for a point of codimension 1 in x and I want to compute partial sub x of this alpha. Okay, so this is an example of a cyclic algebra. Algebra, remember, okay, I guess I'm supposed to be put a minus one here to be precise. So this means I take the cyclic algebra where the element of the Galois group sends square root five to minus square root five, and then that's my element of the ground field. So square root five is a constant extension. It's not really an extension of the function field of x, it's just the the compositum of a extension of the function field of Q. So it's definitely going to be unramified everywhere. So this is a very nice situation where this extension is unramified at every codimension one point. So I can just use my criterion I gave earlier about the valuation. So this equals zero if and only if, oh, maybe I shouldn't have used script X. Hopefully my script X's will look different enough from those X's. So this is if and only if um, either the valuation of x uh, splits completely in this extension, or the valuation of x plus y over x is even. Okay. So one thing we get from this is, well, this if the valuation of x plus y over x is zero, zero is even. We're mathematicians, we know that, unlike the Wikipedia article. So, <laughs> so this is even. So then we immediately get that it's unramified. So we only have to check the curves in the, in the divisor of x plus y over x. So I'm just going to do when x plus y is zero, but the argument works the same way. So if we look at x plus y being zero, well, x plus y being zero, this forces s squared minus 5t squared to be zero. So geometrically, that splits over q adjoint square root 5, that splits as an s minus square root 5t and an s plus square root 5t. Okay, so when the valuation of x plus y over x is positive, then we get that the valuation is splitting completely. So if, uh, so let me say it like this, if x corresponds to the vanishing of x plus y in this surface, then in uh, the function field of x adjoining the square root 5, uh, x splits completely. Another way to say this geometrically is this corresponds to a prime divisor on x, but when I look at the extension, when I look at x over square root 5, it splits into two irreducible curves. That's the same as the valuation statement. Okay, So this tells you that the residue is trivial at the vanishing of x plus y, and a similar argument tells you that the residue is trivial at x. So, okay, so that proves our claim. 
Okay, and what is, is alpha of p? Well, as long as your point is not in uh, the vanishing of x plus y or the vanishing of x, then alpha of p is exactly uh, the quaternion algebra where you just take the x coordinate of p, oh, x plus y. You take this function and you evaluate it at p. So that's what it is. So it's not obvious what this element is in this closed subset. So we'll come back to that later. But away from that closed subset, we just take that function. It's some non-zero number, and that's our that's our quaternion algebra. Okay. So now that we have this map, how do we use it to get an obstruction? Well, okay. Um, you're gonna put this here, but then I want to see the other paper in a minute. So it's limited time offer on that paper. Okay, so let's fix our alpha in the Brouwer group of x. Well, then what do we get? So if we take a k rational point, I evaluate it, alpha of this point, and I land in the Brouwer group of k. And then the k rational points include in the adelic points, which remember that's the restricted direct sum of the kv points with respect to the ov points. So when I evaluate this, I can just evaluate on each component and this is the restricted direct product of the Brouwer group of KV with respect to the Brouwer group of OV. And I don't remember whether this example was covered or not, but the Brouwer group of OV is actually uh, trivial. So if you have a product where for all but finitely many of the um, components, it has to land in a group which is the trivial group, this is just the direct sum. Okay. Great, so now we have, I'm just gonna do this so it's on the same row and looks pretty. Okay, and then we can embed this diagonally. This diagram commutes. And now, um, if you've taken class field theory, you should be like, oh, oh, I know, I know. Fill in, fill in this row. I mean, what else would you do when you have an injection from Brouwer K into the conclusion? So we have to, we have to fill it in. Okay, so now let's look what happens. Well, if I have an adelic point, I can map it down, evaluate it under alpha, and go to Q mod Z. If I knew it came from a rational point, then instead of going this way, I could go this way. And we have a complex on the bottom. So let me call this T sub alpha. So what this diagram tells you, the fact that the bottom is a complex, this implies that the set of k rational points land inside the inverse image of zero under this map. Okay, you can't just take any old adelic point. It has to be one that satisfies this condition. Okay, so let's call this, this set, we're going to denote x of ak upper alpha. It's going to be the adelic points that are orthogonal to alpha. So we're going to think of this element in the Brouwer group as giving us a pairing. Okay, but notice that this, at the beginning, we fixed an alpha in the Brouwer group of x, but there was nothing at all special about what element we took, right? All we used was that it was in the Brouwer group. So what we actually get is that for any, any subset, not even subgroup, any element in the Brouwer group of x, this is contained in the set of adelic points orthogonal to s, which is the intersection over all elements in the Brouwer group, uh, sorry, in S orthogonal to alpha. And particular interest will be when S is equal to the whole Brouwer group. I mean, if you have everything, why not use everything? And so instead of writing X of AK Brouwer X, we will just write X of AK upper Brouwer. Okay, the x will be implicit where it's coming from. Okay, so.
So if we look at this map, how do we get this condition? Well, if you remember, how did we compute these invariants? Well, we just said that there was some isomorphism, but in general, it's hard to compute. If I give you a central simple algebra, how do you evaluate this map? Well, you really, what I want you to take home from this is intrinsic in this description, given how we wrote elements of the Brouwer group of KV and how we described the invariant map, you really want to know what alpha is as a, you really want to have a representative of the class. You don't just want to have some class of Azumai algebras or some element of H2. We really want to write it here as a central simple algebra. Okay, so in this case, we could do that. This is part of the reason why I want to think of Brouwer X as a central simple algebra over the function field, because then this allows me, oh, back. Limited time offer was a little longer than I expected. Okay, well, we evaluated it and we got our um, quaternion algebra. This is something that we can evaluate the invariant map on. But notice that I don't have it at every point, right? I have it at the points outside of this closed subset. So right now, this is a little bit annoying because I would like to just think of my, I would like to have a representative over the function field, but probably it's not going to be defined everywhere. So how do I take my representative, which is not defined everywhere, but be able to compute this phi sub alpha no matter where my point lives? Well, luckily, we have some very nice properties about this evaluation map, particularly with regards to the topology. So if x is smooth, uh, then the evaluation map from the kv points to Brouwer group of kv, this is locally constant. Okay, so the value of um, alpha cannot change on some closed subset. Cannot change on some, so if I know it, if I know what it is on this open subset of the variety for all KV points in this open, then I can uh, use continuity to know what the argument is everywhere. Okay, so even though it seems like I actually need to evaluate it at every point, I can get away with just evaluating it on some open and use this to conclude what it is everywhere. Yes? Yes, I mean for the KV topology, but uh, the Zurisky, if you take the KV points on, um, the KV points on a closed in the Zurisky topology, that will not be open in the KV topology. So what I said still makes sense, even though I was a little sloppy about what the topology was. Okay. Oh, um, let me just mention, so so this obstruction, um, I mean, the definition works perfectly fine for every element of the Brouwer group, but there are certain classes of the Brouwer group that don't play any role that don't give you an obstruction. So, so x is a variety over k. Then we're going to let Brouwer 0 of k be the image of the elements from the ground field into the Brouwer group of x. So these are the constant algebras. So if you evaluate it at any point, well, so let's draw our picture. Um, we have spec f to x to spec k, All right? So this means that the algebra is just coming from pullback here. So if I pull it back to there as well, I could have instead just taken this arrow and pulled it back, and it's it's blind to what point you actually took. It has nothing to do with what point you took. So construction uh, coming from constant algebras is just uh, well, it's trivial. There's no obstruction. Okay, so 
So Brouwer zero, we don't care about. So if ever I say the Brouwer group is trivial, I don't mean that it's zero because generally it, over number fields it will never be trivial. What I mean is it's just these constant algebra. Okay, so that's one subset. And then there's another subset. Uh, oh, I probably shouldn't have drawn this here. Okay, just ignore that for now. So this is contained in what we call Brouwer one. This is the kernel of Brouwer x bar x to Brouwer x bar or separable closure except okay so it's the elements that become trivial when you base change your ground field to uh, the separable closure so these are the algebraic elements algebraic <laughs> and then this is contained in the whole Brouwer group and the remaining elements are called the transcendental part, or maybe the quotient is called the transcendental part. It's a little, sometimes I mean elements, sometimes I mean cosets. Okay, but hopefully it shouldn't cause a problem. So there's nothing, um, there's nothing intrinsically special about these algebraic elements with regard to this obstruction. I mean, of course, they're special because they're algebraic, but this diagram doesn't care about whether or not it's algebraic. It's just an element of the Brouwer group. However, computationally, we have many more methods to understand the Brouwer group. So sometimes we will be interested in considering the algebraic Brouwer set, so just the elements, uh, you just take the intersection over all algebraic elements just because it's easier for us to compute that and sometimes right away we already got the answer we want. Um, back there and then I can do his. Um, well, it means that it's in this is going to be a very unsatisfying answer. It just means that it becomes trivial when you base, you know, tensor with k of x sep when you tensor with the so when you tensor with um, k sep. I mean, it's yeah, it's just what it means. So, for instance, this this element is algebraic because very clearly, when you base change it to q bar, five becomes a square, and so you get that it's trivial. Uh, but they might not always be written this way. They might not look algebraic, even though they are algebraic. This one is very clearly algebraic. Oh, and then there was another question. Oh, it's x base change to the separable closure of k. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that notation at the beginning. OK. So what do I want to do next? Okay, um, let me just state, oh, I'm missing a page somewhere, oh well. Oh, it's here, great. Okay, so it turns out the using this, I think I won't have time to go through the argument, but um, it is in the exercises and also there's a proof in my lecture notes, but you should try the exercise and then read the proof. Um, so you can show that uh, alpha of PV, so for fix of V, and then for all elements in the completion, so X is somewhere, X is this one. So for all points in the completion, this is going to be zero if v is not five, and one half if v is equal to five. So what you do is you prove that this is true for this subset, and then by continuity you get that it's true on the whole thing. Okay, and now this immediately tells you that that the that the set of Q points on X, oh, I guess I could have made this a Q. 
Question? This? Oh, this is alpha? Is that the question? Okay, yeah, that's alpha, the same alpha. Okay, so what this tells you is that x of q has to be empty. Okay, I wrote it right this time, right? Because if we take any adelic point, then we sum it over. Well, for all places except for 5, it's 0. And for v is 5, we get 1 half. So that means it definitely can't come from the k rational points. Okay. This is vaguely in order. Okay, so that is the bauer monin obstruction. That's what we get from the Brouwer group. Um, so when Manin introduced this, um, it explained all known counterexamples to the Haas principle. All of them could be put in this framework. So it seems pretty great. Maybe that's everything. Okay. I still have lots of time left, so probably not. <laughs> so uh, in 1999, Skorobogatov defined what's called the Atal Brouwer obstruction. Okay, so um, how does this work? And he also showed that it's stronger than the Brouwer Monad obstruction. So I'm going to get there, but I'm not just going to define it and then tell you it's the same as what we had before. It's different, it's stronger. Okay, so let's let G be a finite etal K group scheme. And F from Y to X is a G torsor. Okay, so what I mean is that, uh, well, it's FTPF, G torsor. So locally, in this sense of locally, this just looks like uh, x, y just looks like x cross g. It's not isomorphic x cross g, but if you shrink to enough opens, then that's what it is. Okay, and it has an action of g on the fibers. Okay, so why is this going to help us? Uh, yes, yes, because I'm starting with 1 over k. Yes, sorry. No need to make it more complicated. Okay, so how does this help us? Well, let's take a k rational point on x. Okay, what I'm going to say is works for any field, but if you want, you can stick to global fields. Okay, then what we can do is we can just take the fiber above this little point x, and that's a g torsor over k. Okay, well, we know that G torsors over K are classified by elements of H1. So if I take a, a G torsor up to isomorphism, I can partition the K rational points into subsets depending on what isomorphism class of torsor they give me. So this is, I just take the K rational points where the class of this torsor is equal to the class of my chosen torsor. Okay, so I just partition up the points. I no longer think of them as all being equal. They're divided into buckets. Okay, so why is this useful? Well, it turns out that there's a construction. So for any, given any co-cycle, representing a class in H1 kg, you can construct using contracted products a y sub tau, which is a g torsor over x. And what's the additional property it has? Well, if I take the k rational points on y, oh, yeah, sorry, thanks. Uh, I don't know how I should do that, whatever. Um, 
that's good enough. Okay. <laughs> so if I take the k rational points on y and I map them down, that is exactly the set. Uh, call this x tau of. Mm. upper tail or something. I should have just said this in words. All right, so if I take the k rational points here and map them down, it's exactly the k rational points on x who is such that the torso, I get this way, is the same class as the class of tau. Okay, so I don't just get this uh, partition as elements in a set. I can think of them as images of k rational points on some other variety. So why is that better? Well, now I already have this tool. I already have the brower monon instruction. So let's see what the brower monon instruction gives me on y. So now I'm going to rewrite all of this. So this first partition, instead of just thinking about this the set theoretic way, I can think about it as I take these elements. So tail of k and map them down. But now I know some conditions on here. Well, k rational points are hard, so even now I have infinitely many things. I want to compute the k rational points on there. Well, I can instead, this sits inside the set of italic points, and then it also sits inside the ones that are orthogonal to the Brouwer group. And I can just take those and map them down. Okay, so this is contained in the set of idyllic points of x. Of course, I don't just take the ones for a fixed tau. I take the union over all of these h1s. And then I do the same thing that I did with the Brouwer group. I notice that what I've done has nothing particular to do with this y and this f, just like the Brouwer modern instruction had nothing to do with that particular Brouwer class. It works for any torsor under a finite idyllic group. So I take the intersection over all maps y to x, uh, g finite h. And this is going to be called the Atal Brouwer set. Okay, and this sits inside of here. Okay, so, uh, okay, let me just write a few more things. So computationally, you know, what we're doing is we really, let me go back to this again, we really want to study the k rational points. So every time I give you something, you should ask, wait, but is this easier to compute than the k rational points? Because if it's not, why did I just do this? Why did I do this? So, and this looks pretty, pretty terrible. <laughs> right, this is like a big, infinite product on each one of those. I have to compute the Brouwer group. What on earth is going on here? But so what you can prove is that if x is proper, then and, and f from y to x is this uh, torsor under this finite digital group, then um, phi tau of the adelic points is empty for all tau in here outside of a finite set. Okay, so this seemingly horrible union, as long as x is proper, uh, really drops down and becomes something much nicer. And we'll see in practice, there's not really that many okay, for surfaces, the surfaces we're going to consider, there's not so many different uh, torsors, so this will also drop away. Um, it's, it's, um, so if you do, oh God, I'm going to mess up all the adjectives. So there are lots of comparisons. You can think of this, the Atal Brouwer set. So the Brouwer Monin obstruction, you can think of an example of the descent obstruction. So you're taking torsors instead of under finite groups, you're taking them under, uh, yeah, more general group schemes over k. So 
This, this individual set you can think of as um, coming from a descent obstruction, and then the way um, Skorbogatov and Harari and probably others think about this is that this is like a descent under a non-abelian group, that you can sort of think of this as an iterated descent. Um, but if you, yeah, so there's a relationship, but maybe let me not say more than that right now, and we can talk later. Okay, so even though this looks kind of terrible to compute, it is actually reasonable to compute in practice. Okay. Um, okay, let me just do two examples. So let's give an example of why this is the case. Um, so let me take my y to be intersection. So xy plus 5z squared minus s squared. This will look very similar, um, and you will see why, but not until the fourth lecture. So you have to come back. Okay, so let's take that. And I'm just going to state lots of claims uh, and leave them to you as an exercise. They're also in the notes. So let's take the involution on P5 to P5, which flips the signs of the first three coordinates, or the last three, whatever you want. Okay, so you can check that sigma restricted to Y has no fixed points. So uh, the quotient from Y to Y mod sigma is an atoll double cover. So let's say an atoll torsor under Z mod 2. Okay, so then, oh, I should have left more room. That's okay. So what are these H1s, these Y upper taus? Well, H1, Q, Z mod 2, so this is just Q star mod squares. So I can think of an element here as being some square-free integer. So then y upper d, and this is not any kind of product. This is just the twist by d. What do I do? Let's do it up here. I just take either the terms involving x or the terms involving s and put a d in front of this equation. Okay, so if you want to define what these twists are in full generality for any kind of group, it gets kind of complicated, and that's why I didn't state the definition. It will not, just involves more than I can say in like two minutes. Um, but in a given example, you can trace through. And actually, it's um, a very nice exercise to check why the Q rational points on this quotient are partitioned by the square free integers and correspond to solutions like this. It's not that difficult. You just unwind definitions. What are rational points on here? Well, there are degree two points on here with an action with sigma interchanging them. What does that mean in the equations? And you get this. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about that. Okay, so the main obstructions we have so far, so we have the Atal Brouwer obstruction that's contained in the brouwer manin set, and that's contained in the algebraic brouwer manin set, which, again, I stress is mostly because of computational reasons that we separate them. This is generally easier to compute than this is. Okay, so that's what we have. That's our story for formal obstructions meaning that there is a definition I can give you of a subset of Adelic points, you know, using general machinery that contains the K rational points. Unfortunately, that is not everything. So there's a theorem, this was due to Poonen, um, I think it was published in 09 or 10, one of those. Came out definitely by 09, 
when he announced it, I think, in 08. So there exists a K variety for any K for all global fields. K, there exists an X over K such that X has no rational points and has empty H. L. Brower set. Okay. So, um, oh, non-empty H. L. Brower set. Just is. Just is. Yeah. Okay. So this does not tell uh, the full story. So why is it interesting to um, talk about these? Well, there were similar examples. Um, so you could also ask, okay, well, how? What kind of x can you find? You know, how small can the dimension be? What kind of geometric properties can it have? So I'm out of time, so let me just put the names. Um, so Harpaz Skorbogatov showed that x can you can find a surface that does this. Kolotelen, Paul, and Skorbogatov showed that you can take a a quadric bundle over um, higher genus curve, also a conic bundle over a surface, and then. Arna Smates showed that um, you can also take X to have trivial Albanese, and assuming a conjecture, ABC conjecture, you can also assume that X is simply connected. But very quickly, I'm just going to say the common feature in all of these examples is that X maps to um, some variety Z, which maps to P1, such that the image of the K rational points and here is finite. So they all have this property. And this is lower dimensional. Uh, C lower dimensional. Okay, so for surfaces that don't map to positive genus curve, you might maybe, you know, you may still hope that these obstructions are enough because then they Okay, well, you need a little bit more than just that they don't map to a um, positive genus curve. But some conditions on what sort of curves they map to, we can still hope for these to hold. And that's what I'll talk about tomorrow.